Let's talk about this guy, Dopey Benny Fine. His real name was, I got it here someplace, hold on, his real, I better have it. His real name was Benjamin Moses Fine and Schneider. He was a Russian, but I don't, uh, a Russian Jew, but Fine Schneider seemed German to me. I don't know. His parents were Russians. He was born in 1887 in the U.S. His brother, Billy, his sister, Bessie, Annie, Jesse, they were born in Russia, but Benny and his brother Herbert and Samuel were born here. His sister Bertha was born here in Brooklyn. He grew up between Brooklyn and, and um, high school sweetheart, grammar school sweetheart, a girl named Gertrude Lorberg. She died just a few years after he did in 63, 64. They had three children, two sons, Morton and Paul, and a girl, Jeanette. Uh, they just died recently, in recent memory, like 10 years ago. Uh, the father was a tailor. He was, by all accounts, a good man, a decent man. He tried his best to raise up a good family. Benny got his name, Dopey Benny, from the, an adroinal condition that gave him this sleepy look. Uh, and then I do think later on he got whacked in the face and that just added to it. When they asked to explain it, he said, I don't know. I've never used dope. I got the title of a nickname years ago. I don't know, because one time in the, when was it, like 1916, the cops raided his place uh, and they found a boatload of cocaine. So I, I don't know. Maybe he was selling it. You know. So as a teenager, he trained first as a pickpocket and then a petty thief. By 1905, he was heading his own little street gang. He would eventually serve time for armed robbery. He was arrested twice for murder, never convicted on those charges. By the time he was 16, uh, his resume included pickpocketing, highway robbery, burglary, gun for hire. I've ticketed his arrest to include there are about 80 arrests in his lifetime. Uh, no, in his lifetime, I'm going to say from 1905, his criminal lifetime, 1905, 19. He joined in 1910, he joined Big Jack Zellick's crew. Jack Zellick is a, an odd guy. He, his name may actually have been Billy Alberts or Harry Morris, and although he said he was Jewish, there doesn't seem to be a lot of evidence that he was. He, he uh, but he did control uh, a predominantly Jewish immigrant workforce in the garment district. He was a labor extortionist. Uh, when Zelik was killed, Benny just broke off on his own, and he started his own labor extortion business in the garment district, and he had running battles, literally gun battles in the streets with this Italian racketeer named Joey Sirocco, another guy, Joe the Greaser Rosenwig over territories. They fought for sidewalk space. They fought for streets. In 1913, again, Zelich said, Benny tries to break the grass with the Rosenzweig, who was a Romanian, born in Romania. He had an iron grip on the garment district. So there was this battle, it was an uprising. It was known as the Labor Sluggers War. It lasted from 1913 to 1916. I want to point something out to you. Um, these guys were scumbags, including Benny. These people who came from Russia, they had a tradition of working in clothing and making clothing and so But these factories were horrible, god awful places. Have you ever heard of the uh, fire in, in 1906 or something where all those poor women were trapped. They locked them inside so they couldn't get up uh, and sneak away from work or leave early. And the building caught fire and they're all burned to death. That's just one incident. They were, the pay was nothing. In the summer it swelted and in the winter it was freezing. It, it was, and on top of this, you've got punks like these guys shaking these people down. And when they tried to form unions, I'm politically conservative, but <laughs> if ever anybody needed a union, it was these guys. You had guys like Benny and Jack Zellick and so forth showing up, beating them senseless with their own guys. In all fairness, though, they could also be rented by the unions to beat up the factory owners, which they did a lot. So at the start of this Slugger's War on August 10, 1913, according to Benny now, there was a patrolman named Patrick Sheridan. Uh, they found him uh, on Forsyth and Grand Street. At the time, Benny lived at 102 4th Street. And the cop says, come on with me, Benny. So they walk to the corner of the bar. There's another foot cop who's waiting for him. The two cops took out their blackjacks in front of 15 witnesses, beat Fink, Benny Fink, really badly. And then they arrested him for saying he tried to take my billy club away from me. 
Um, <laughs> anyway, um, he he wouldn't stand for it. Uh, jury agreed with Sheridan. They found uh, Flame guilty of second degree assault, but he screamed he was innocent until the end of time. For an entire year, so uh, he said, I've been framed. These guys are out to get me. I've tried my best to be a good boy and avoid trouble, he said, but the police would not have any of it. I am not without a heart. I am a human. Barely, but he it was a human. The judge didn't want to hear about it. He sent him away to Sing Sing for five years. Um, on January 25, 1914, they flew him on a train. His father, Isaac, came to the tombs where Benny was being held, and he knew he was going to be sent away and to see his son. And the guard said, well, he's just left. You won't see him for five more years. And the father burst out into tears. In, on May 13, 1914, the conviction was overturned. Something about that case, by the way, is that during the trial, um, they had to get a dozen cops who came into the courthouse with their guns out because Benny's gang was in the hallway and watching the trial and so forth. And the cops had to fight them to get him out of the building. Uh, they were there to intimidate people. Um, when they took Benny to Sing Sing, it's just up the river, you know. Uh, you get on a train, it's like an hour. And it's, uh, you can go to Sing Sing Prison. They don't call it that anymore. They call it Danamora. I know it's not Danamora. They, they have a different name for it. It's not Sing Sing anymore. But it's about an hour. And they were so afraid of Benny's gang coming to shoot it out and free him that they took him out at three in the morning with a, a squad of policemen who were armed with rifles. So in 1914, Benny's, he's now out of jail. He gets arrested for trying to extort 500 bucks from the business agents for the 509, for the butcher's union. This guy's name was Ben Solomonowitz. And <laughs> Benny was very direct. He'd pay me off, kill you. Uh, I mean, how it worked is if he went up to one of these union guys and said, pay me or I'll kill you. The guy said, I don't have any money on him. Then he said, all right, fine. I'll meet you next week. You better have money. Well, he did it in the case of the Sulman Itwitz, who then went to the police. So when Benny shows up, the cops are waiting for him um, and they arrested him. So fines arrested. He's tossed back into the tombs. Bail is set at eight grand. So eight grand, you know, that was a serious cash. And he waited his cell for two days, expecting to be bailed out by his gang, gang member, his friends in Tammany Hall. He had friends in Tammany Hall because Tammany Hall would occasionally pay him to bust up some of his political campaign. Uh, and he paid, in turn, paid Tammany Hall to have friends there. Nothing happened. Uh, he'd been sold out, basically. He contacted the district attorney and he started, Benny did, and he started to name names. He gave 80 pages of testimony detailing every aspect of labor union within the garment district. This is online, by the way. You can look it up. It's uh, NYU's library. You can read it. It's exhausting, but you can read it. It was a who's who, right? And he got everybody. Monkeys from Big Red Village. Um, he came to declare war on these guys. He told the police, quote, my first job as a gangster for hire was go to, <laughs> I didn't really call himself a gangster. My first job as a gangster for hire was to go to a shop and beat up some workmen there. The man that employed me, a union official, paid me $100 for my work and $10 for each of the men that I hired. I planned the job and then told my employer that it would take more men than I figured uh, and I would not touch it for under 600. He agreed. I got my men together, divided them into squads, pass out pieces of gas pipe and clubs to them. We met the workmen we were after. They came to work and we beat them up. We beat them up good. I didn't want to mix up in the work myself, so I stayed out of it. But where I could, uh, on the side of watching my men, I smoked cigarettes. The man who employed me said he liked the work I did. He paid me a $500 bonus, and that started me in this line of work. Fine later said he charged 150 to wreck a small factory, um, the big shops, he charged 600 uh, If you wanted somebody's ear cut off, a leg broken, that ranged from 60 to 100 bucks. It depended on a lot of things. So throwing here, he had another price. Throwing a man or did out in the elevator shaft was 200 Do you believe the detail of this? He made $10,000 a year doing that. Uh, doesn't sound like much, but $10,000, well, I don't know. I'm going to guess a quarter of a million value maybe today. Uh, he said he was offered 15000 cash to go to work for the bosses 
instead of the laborers. He said he turned them down and he bragged, I was working for the people. Yeah, I don't know about that. Anyway, uh, he hired out strong arm women, by the way, as well. He paid them seven fifty a day. Pretty good money, a lot more money than they could make in the factory. Uh, $19 a day. He's so $19. Uh, it was at the same time that he paid, it was the same amount he paid the men. So he was open minded about these things. Usually, six to ten women would go into these places uh, and bust it up because most of the people in these shops were women. You know? uh, fine, he held trials for those he accused of breaking union laws. Um, he invited them to defend themselves if they couldn't. He just beat the living daylights out of them. Uh, on August 10, 1910, Benny tracked down this guy, uh, Herman Leibowitz, a member of the Government Workers Union, who was moonlighting upstate in a non-union job. So Benny tracks him down to 8050's 4th Street, cracks his skull open. Leibowitz dies at Bellevue Hospital a short time later. Next, he beat up a guy named Benjamin Singh Day. Benjamin Poehler, a union leader who was, as Fine said, in the way of some other union people. Wow. Then Max Fisch Flesher, a union organizer who had offended some workers. He was nearly beaten to death in a restaurant, 106 Delancey Street, which I think is still a restaurant. Uh, they broke a beer bottle over his head. They left a written note on the body that he was to retire from union business, plain and simple. Benny and his men destroyed shops at 77 Green Street that belonged to Max and Joe Lampert because they refused to pay uh, union wages of less than $100. Shops that belonged to Max, Max Roth at 115 Broadway, another shop that belonged to Ron Cushion at 41 East 21st Street were out and out destroyed. Rather than kill the witnesses, Fine offered them a chance to relocate to Cleveland, Ohio. Oh, reasonable. His, all his men carried guns, but they, guns weren't something they usually used because the possession of a gun, if you're arrested, is a big deal. You're going away for a long time. Uh, so usually they had their girlfriends or paid prostitutes go with them. They carried the guns, and when they needed them, they go to the girl, get the gun. Um, and when Fine, uh, he kept a diary of his life as a union girl. It's incredible, he did, but it, it, names, dates, time, places. Uh, based on those notes, the DA issued 32 indictments against hoodlums and labor officials, none of which resulted in conviction. Benny was released without charges uh, on May 15, 1915. In 1914, going back here, during a clash between union and non-union help at the South Feldman Hat Factory at 168 Green Street, which is in Manhattan, a non-union enforcer named Max Green, who lived at 146 East Houston, I don't know where that is, who had worked for Joe Sirico, was shot to death after he shot a pistol at Hyman Emanuel, one of Benny's guys. Uh, and he hit, hit him in the leg. So Maxie Gordon, who would become Benny's uh, lieutenant, Maxie Gordon later hit it big in Prohibition. Um, he had a pistol on him and he shot Max Green in return. So on December 12, 1914, some of the men from Benny's gangs were inside the Madison Square Garden. They're watching a bicycle race. Suddenly, they're surrounded by Joe Sirocco's guys, and they challenge them to a fight. So they're outnumbered. Fine and his guys refuse the fight. But at some point, Anthony Scantulio, uh, a.k.a. Tony the Chief, of course, what a great name, who lived at 165 Hester Street, he's one of Sirocco's guys. Somebody fired a gun. This guy, Scantulio, gets shot in the head. Tony Rose... And Frank Nigger Dula were arrested for the shooting. Later, another fight broke out in front of the London Theater near Broadway. So everyone's looking for revenge at this point because of the attack at Madden Square Garden. Benny and his gang, they came to Arlington Hall at 12. The building is still there. You could rent the hall for parties and weddings and so forth. You could rent the bottom uh, floor. Today, I think it's an apartment house or something um, in Manhattan. The Sirocco gang had rented the place. They're having their annual ball. You think this gang's having an annual ball? Uh, so Benny and his guys, they're waiting outside for the right moment. They see this guy, Charlie Piazza, who worked for Sirocco. He walks down the street. They shot him through the left shoulder, and then they went back to hanging out near the hall. 
So Joe Soroka's guys here, the shooting, they run down the street. A bullet goes wild. They're shooting at each other in, in the middle of Manhattan. A lot of them are shooting at each other. And this guy, Frederick Strauss, he's a clerk in the court. He was minding his own business. He got shot and killed immediately. He just fell dead immediately. So <laughs> later that year, Benny gets packed off to Sing Sing for a five-year thing for beating up the police. We'd already covered that. Uh, he gets out. Uh, a witness identified Benny and his gang members, uh, little A.B. Berkman, uh, who was born in 1888 and lived at 232 East Broadway Street. Robin... Kaplan, born in 1888, 226 2nd Avenue, as the shooters of this poor, this hapless guy. Uh, so the cops show up and they arrest two guys uh, for killing this hapless um, clerk who was just minding his own business walking down the street. One witness identified Dopey Benny as leading this gang, and they said the shooters were little A.B. Berkman who lived at 232 Broadway, East Broadway Street, and Reuben Kaplan, who lived at 226 Second Ave, as the shooters, again, fall, being told what to do by Benny. Um, I, I think it was a pure accident. I, I don't think he was there. Anyway, uh, Waxy Gordon, who lived at 25 Delancey Street, I've been there, was a member of Dopey Benny's gang. He later became Dopey Benny's lieutenant, and during the Prohibition, did great, became a multimillionaire. Unfortunately, he had a dope problem, and, his life didn't go so good. Um, anyway, another witness said that uh, he saw Gordon run up to the hall, bouncer, a character named Eddie Morris, a fat bull, and he cried, fat bull, hide me. In the end, they were all released due to the lack of evidence. Um, and the Sluggers War really ruined it for everybody. The cops were all over them and everything. Eventually, Penny, Benny's uh, power, his influence waned. In November 1925, he was arrested in a case that involved cocaine. In 1916, him and a guy named Morris, Moses Cornick, Moses Cornick, what a great name again, robbed thousands of dollars in silk fabric. The cops knew who did it. They go to Benny's apartment at 668 DeKalb Ave in Brooklyn, and not only do they find the silk he's stolen, he's going to resell it in the Midwest, they find the cocaine. I mean, that's, that's the end of him. In 1931, they get him, they get Benny again for felonious assault in connection with a labor dispute. The story is that Benny, Sammy Hirsch, Jamie Rubin um, were accused of emptying a gallon jug of acid. Imagine that. And this guy, Mortimer Kahn, in front of a neckwear factory at 124 Allen Street uh, that Kahn owned. Um, Benny watched while Hirsch threw the acid on this poor guy. And moving with the getaway guy. The guy lived. As, uh, I can imagine how, my God, how awful that must have been. Uh, years ago. 68. My father and mother knew this woman. She was very pretty. I remember, very tall, regal, you know. And she was dating a cop. This is in Bridgeport, Connecticut. And, you know, anyway dating a cop and something happened. I don't know. He threw acid in my face. And I saw her after that. Oh, Lord Jesus. How, how awful, you know? Uh, she was really badly disfigured. I guess today they can do plastic surgery. Anyway, back to the story. In 1942, Benny gets sentenced to 10 to 20 years for trying to uh, fence 2.5 million worth of stolen property. Again, he hit the garment center in Manhattan. Um, <laughs> the judge was going to give Benny life for this. But Benny points out, well, you can't really do that because my prior arrests were for misdemeanors and not felonies, my, his most prior arrest. So the judge said, all right, you're right. He sent us 10, 20 years. His partner in this thing, this guy, Abe Nibby Cohen, who was an old timer from the Lower East Side, he was convicted. After his release from Sing Sing, Benny settled down. He went to work as a tailor, of all things. He died in 1962 from cancer, from emphysema. I read a report, I, I have no, I can't prove it, I don't know, that he died destitute. Uh, one other thing, there were, remarkably, two Dopey Benny finds in New York's criminal world at the same time. Uh, Dopey Benny, the other guy, was killed in 1923 again.
Lydia, oh Lydia, say have you met Lydia? Lydia the tattooed lady. She has eyes that folks adore so, and a torso even more so. Lydia, oh Lydia, that encyclopedia. Oh Lydia, the queen of tattoo. On her back is the Battle of Waterloo. Beside it, the wreck of the Hesperus too. And proudly above waves the red, white, and blue. You can learn a lot from Lydia. <laughs>